And I will make you host so that I don't forget to do that. <laughs> okay, excellent. So I'm going to call to order the April 24th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.04 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. With the extension, extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And let's make sure that everybody can be heard since we since I had an issue. And I'll start with you, Dr. Rhodes. I'm here. Great. It's great to see you. And back in Amherst, yes? Yes, I am. <laughs> Welcome home. Thank you. Uh, and Hala. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. And Ms. Bridges. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. And you have your camera off. That's how you want it right now, I assume. Is that is that right? Yes, I'm on the phone. Okay, perfect. All right. So I know that uh, Yvonne is not able to join us. I'm just going to send a quick text to Dr. Shabazz and to Alexis. And then we'll get started. All right, great. Let's see, and I'm just gonna check attendees. Oh, Dr. Shabazz is actually in the audience. So um, I guess now I can promote him. And he should be moving over. Great. Yes, I, I hear everyone. Welcome, Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, okay, so just reviewing the agenda, it's been a couple weeks since we met and our survey has been live. And so I'm going to, of course, provide an update on that. Dr. Rhodes and I received an update from the Dunhue Institute this morning. And then we have a, a definite other item that we need to get to today, which is um, our Amherst Cultural Council grant. Um, we have the opportunity to amend it so that we can ut utilize the $500 that was granted to us. And Pamela and I have been working together to, to think about some ideas for that. So we'll just wanna review that with the committee. Um, and then we also have uh, some listening session, um, just a, a little discussion on listening sessions and some thoughts I have on that. And then I would like to touch on our final report as well. So any questions before we get to it? All right, great. Um, I did want to share something really quickly with the group that I came across today, and I'm going to try to share screen here. Um, I have been doing a lot of historical research on the town of Amherst, and I've been reading through dozens of um, annual town reports, and they're very, very, very interesting. Um, I can send the link to everyone. You can search by date, and if you know something important was happening in a particular time period, you can search. And it's it's really been illuminating to me. Um, but I wanted to share something I came across today. And let's see, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So in 1969, um, at the proposal of several citizen groups, the annual town meeting created a temporary, broadly representative 11 member citizens review commission to study and make recommendations which would more fully extend democratic government and equal opportunities to all inhabitants. And um, interestingly, it says that uh, the commission's focus was on four major areas, education, housing, and real estate, employment, and governmental institutions. And its conclusion says, basically Amherst is a typical Western Massachusetts town whose overwhelming white majority possesses 
substantial racist attitudes toward Blacks, whose very environment and educational system permits the perpetuation of the economic and social disadvantages encountered by individuals of low income backgrounds, both white and black, whose college students encounter the universal prejudice in, an, uh, in attempting to find housing or rentals, and whose secondary school population reflects the general polarization between the college community and the non-college community. Um, I was able to search down uh, over at the archives at UMass the full report, and I'm picking that up today at four o'clock. Um, I think that it will be really interesting for us to take a look at that. Um, this commission made recommendations based on these um, four areas, and it seems to me that they're just as relevant then as, as they are now. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and see if anyone had any thoughts or questions or comments about that. Yes, Dr. Shabazz. I um, think I'm accurate on this, but uh, uh, one of the members of this commission is none other than William Sandy Darity. Junior. Oh, wow. Recently, um, a few months ago, at the memorial ceremony for Professor Jules Chemetsky, uh, William Darity Jr. was zoomed in to give remarks. And one of the things that came up in the discussion is that. Um, he was on that 1969 commission. I think Jules was as well. And mm -hmm. Jules might have recommended or something they wanted to have a youth, uh, a young person participant. But when you get the document and you look at the, uh, the members of the Citizen Review Commission, take a look if it doesn't say Sandy or, or William Darity Jr. Absolutely. And as soon as I have it, I don't know how they're going to let me have it. It may be pictures, it may be uh, photocopies. Um, I will send it to the to the to the assembly um, to, to look at. Thank you for that, Dr. Shabazz. And now that you say it, I remember you telling me about that a few months ago. So any other comments or questions on that right now? All right, great. So let's um, Dr. Rhodes, do you want me to read out the uh, report that came from Ellen this morning? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me just grab that. So we have a report from the Donahue Institute. Um, and uh, let's see. Too many emails. Um, Strange. Here we go. All right. So as of uh, today, early this morning, we have 363 responses to the survey. 41 of those respondents said they identify as Black. Um, and then in the other demographics for uh, race, we have um, three that uh, identified as American Indian or Alaskan Native, five Asian, 37 Black or African American, 206 White, zero Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 36 prefer not to say, and 23 from some other, identified some other race. Um, so, and the 41 who identify as uh, Black is representing about 11% of the total respondents. So, I wanted to pause and see what folks' reactions are to those numbers. We're about two weeks in, and my sense is we will keep this open until uh, Friday, May 5th. So we have about two more weeks. Any, any comments or concerns or questions? Yes, Dr. Rhodes. It's it's kind of disappointing uh, in relationship to the number 
of uh, black people, African Americans who have responded. Um, and given the numbers that we know are here in Amherst. Um, is there, I, I know that there was uh, something being discussed, Michelle, in relationship to uh, mailing. Yes. Doing the mail out uh, to uh, um, African Americans uh, via the census tract information. And that is something that I would really wholeheartedly uh, suggest we do, uh, especially since we have that. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to be able to um, look at these numbers with a more uh, robust representation of Black and African Americans, uh, somewhere hitting around 20% rather than where we are right now. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I agree. Um, I would also like to see that number go up. Um, I think, you know, when I talked to Carrie, she thought the number being that, you know, what our population of Black residents is was a good number. But at the end of the day, um, we want to make sure that we hear from as many uh, folks who identify as Black as possible. So what we did is I requested um, a full resident um, list from our town clerk. And the Dunahue Institute overlaid the that onto the Black census and then gave us essentially a list of all of the um, blocks where there are more than 10 people who have listed African-American on the census in that block. And so what we can do, and we have, we have actually everything. So what we can do is a direct mailing. Um, I did have a postcard created specifically for this. Um, and so I'm wondering if, uh, if, if others in the group would be willing to review the list and identify folks that they know may identify as Black, um, because then we can even be more targeted. The way that we have it right now is we would have to send it to everybody in that particular block. Um, so if we have a way of going through and highlighting, if you know folks, then we can really target. Um, so if folks are up for that, I will send out the list. And then if you could just go through it and highlight who you know um, and send it just back to me and Pamela and Jennifer, um, and then we'll do a direct mailing out to those people by that, you know, if we can get, if, if everybody can take a look at it in the next day or so, um, we can get that out by the end of the week. That what do you think be, about that, yeah, Dr. Rhodes? That's very helpful. Okay. And we are also working with Hala and Ms. Bridges um, to get it into the newsletters at uh, Goodwin and Hope churches. Um, so th that's another new, new development. Um, we have sent it to all of the groups that we have listed in Yes, Hala, please. Oh, I want, you can finish your sentence, my apologies. Really, if you have an update on the churches, that would be great. Well, oh, not um, an update, even though it is going in our, it is in our newsletter that our clerk sends out for Goodwin. Um, I was also wondering about, I can't remember if we had to be 18 because you're a voting citizen, but maybe through POCU, people of color united at the high school, we could, you know, if we get the youth engaged in engaging their parents or caregivers, maybe. How do we get the word out in different ways that's not just email or a survey on the town website? I'm that, wondering how we activate our youth a little bit. Sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I just got really excited. That's a great idea. That's a really great idea. It did go out to the whole uh, in the newsletter to all of the um, Amherst Regional School families, but I think directing it at POCU would be a really great idea. Does anyone have a contact? Um, My experience has been you need to go through their faculty or administrative person, and that is uh, um, Mary Custer. Custer. I think in general, yeah, she's very, uh, you know, not only with POCU, but if just her own personal list, she could send it out with an endorsement, it would go a long way. Okay, great. 
Yeah, that's Sid actually, Sid Ferreira had recommended the same and he had made a connection between us. So I'll follow up on that and and there we go. We'll try to make that happen. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Any other thoughts about, uh, yes, Pamela? So I was just going to say that I think uh, Jen probably also has some connections at the high school and there are two uh, high school students on the Human Rights Commission um, that we could share it with them um, as well. That's a great idea. I didn't know that there were two high school students on that commission. That's awesome. Okay, great. Um, well, any other ideas or thoughts on that? I, I think that activating, as Hala said, the youth is actually so powerful and could really go a long way. Um, in, in engaging parents and caregivers as well. Um, and if folks have other ideas, just send them our way. Um, does that date, Dr. Rhodes, does that date seem like a good date for us to keep the survey open through till, till May 5th, given our timeline? Yes, um, yeah, not to do that would not be good for us. I, I mean, yes, as long as, as long as we can keep it open, the better. The longer we can keep it open, the better. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd agree as well with extending beyond May fifth. Um, you know, we can still go ahead and and uh, begin to to you know build our our uh, report and analysis. Um, and uh, and then I know that once it is once we do say pull this number with respect to umdi they will you know that at that point they'll be working on uh generating their their uh, analysis based upon you know the the date we say close out but you know there's still no there's no reason necessarily to uh in limit people from uh past that day just want the analysis We'll look at from from Umdi, Umdi if any other comments come in. Excellent. Okay. So what I'll I think that's really yeah that's a great thought to let Carrie and Ellen know that they can begin you know if they need to begin for their purposes to analyze you know on May to begin on May fifth to start to analyze um, to to be uh, to be in aligned with our timeline, then I think that's fine. And we can just continue to keep it open for additional responses. The other thing that everyone should know is we have a paper copy now. So it's um, available. Jennifer and Pamela have it. I, I know they received a request for a paper copy. Um, and we're going to have that distributed um, in a couple different areas. But if you know somebody who would like a paper copy, I have it in a PDF and we can um, we can print the packet for you and make it available so you can get it to whoever that person might be. Um, okay. So any other um, comments or questions right now on the survey? I have heard feedback from some folks who have taken it. Um, they have felt that it was very well, well done and well articulated, clear. Um, and for what surveys can sometimes be, um, we've gotten really good feedback. <laughs> so that's good. Um, so I'm going to open up a period of public comment, our first period of two public comment periods. And I will read our statement during the public comment period. The chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair. No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. The AHRA will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment, but we will be listening very carefully. And there will be a second public comment period before we finish. So um, this is the first. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise use the raise hand function and we will bring you into the room.
Okay, I'm not seeing any. So I'm gonna close that public comment period. And um, let's go to the um, Amherst Cultural Council grant amendment. Um, so you may recall we put in a long time ago at the very beginning of our, our work together, we put in an application to the Amherst Cultural Council. We asked for $5,000. The purpose um, of that money was going to be to create a documentary or to document the AHRA's work. And we received $500. The feedback we received was that we were very early on in our work. And so they um, they encouraged us to come back at a later time when we were further uh, along with our work. So Pamela and I were sort of, um, Pamela has been working with the chairs of the Amherst Cultural Council to help liaison with us in terms of what we need to do to amend our application so that we can use the $500 um, within, you know, the scope of, of what um, is, of what is allowable. So one of the ideas that we have, and this sort of ties into our final report topic, so I'm going to kind of tie these together. Um, one of the options is for us to use that money to transcribe our meetings. Um, and that will give us um, a, a really good way to document all of our meetings um, and could be the beginnings. They it will certainly be used for our final report, but also could be the beginnings of um, the work that we'll need to do if we want to pursue a documentary at some point. So there is a, an excellent service. There are many, but um, I did try to transcribe one of our meetings and it was uh, very, very clear. Um, it was a really great for formatted very, very well, not like something you'd pull off of YouTube. Um, so I'm curious what folks think about that as a possibility for use of this $500. And if there are other ideas, um, we just have to submit this. Pamela, when is th their meeting is um, May 2nd, did you say? Oh, uh, I, I think it's a <laughs> second. I think it's a second. Uh, Tuesday evening in May. So it may be uh, the 9th. But, the 9th. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the 9th. So any thoughts on, on that or should we, is everyone comfortable if we just move forward and, and amend the application um, for that purpose? Okay. Yes, I agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I so I just want to uh, I just want to add that you know so I did reach out to the two co chairs to see if I could get a sense of whether that use would be acceptable to them, and um, I got I'll just say maybe perhaps like lukewarm feedback <laughs> about whether it's something that they would be um, interested in supporting uh, you know so i don't know one way or the other whether whether they would approve it the other thought was um uh, several months ago i was approached by uh, a couple who have um, experience doing uh, storytelling and gathering narratives um, which might be another way to to have that that couple interview you all or interview the assembly about your experience as preparing another way to prepare for a documentary. So I just throw that other out, idea out there. I think it would be a good use to have the transcript, but I, I'm, I don't know whether they will fully support that idea. Thank you, Pamela. I, May, oh, go ahead, Dr. Schwass. No, I was just gonna say, I, I guess we don't know until we, until we follow up and, and submit, you know, along the lines of what what we we think we'd like to do, and and then they can let us know if they if it's consistent with what they're funding. 
Yeah, it's an it's a really easy amendment process. Um, it's it's very simple, and I might even be able to just put in both options to see. You know, um, I did reach out to the folks that Pamela um, mentioned, and I do hope to get together with them soon just to get a, an idea of, about their work and how they might be able to um, help us. Initially, they they wrote back very enthusiastically. Um, and they they sound like really creative folks um, and 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 very committed to this kind of work. Dr. Rhodes, were you going to add something? Yeah, just I think uh, putting in another option would be would do us well, especially yeah. the uh, storytelling. Okay, perfect. Um, so just to be just so. I had a preliminary discussion with the town manager about um, transcribing our 60 plus meetings. And I do think he um, would like for us to seek out some other possible sources of funding to do that um, if we really feel strongly about it. The other thing is we can, uh, we can determine which meetings would be important. Like um, for example, um, and I'm going to move right into the sort of final report piece of our agenda today. So I have been um, in communication with Mattia Kramer, who was integral in the two reports that the Reparations for Amherst group put together. Um, she is an excellent writer. Um, her heart is, is fully in this work, um, and she has a background in this particular kind of um, report writing and research. So we, uh, I have invited her to our next meeting to speak with us about working with us um, on our final report. And one of the things that we've done so far is she has a service that she uses. So she transcribed or is in the process of transcribing our retreat, for example, because that's one where having that documented and, and transcribed, it can be, could be really helpful for us. Um, so more to come on, um, on all of that and and we'll see what shakes out with the Amherst Cultural Council, but I will make sure that we get that in and I'll include both options. Um, let's see. So what I uh, what I the other the other um, piece that I wanted to ask the committee about is we have a couple months left. Um, we're going to be spending a lot of our time when we get the survey results and with a report um, that's due. But there are some listening sessions that I think we can still host um, with groups, one of them being with the, the Amherst Survival Center. I've reached out to the director this morning. Um, Lev and I have talked previously about hosting a listening session um, during one of their community lunches. Uh, and I don't know if folks know, but Jennifer Moyston is, I think, if not already, but about to become the board president of the Amherst Survival Center. Um, and I should say uh, also that Jennifer was uh, nominated by Rep. Mindy Dom um, for a Black Excellence on the Hill Award. And um, I'm just it was she she uh, I was honored to be there with her when she received the award in Boston. And it was just a really, really special. I'd love to share more about it with the group um, when we're together in person. But it was it was really quite amazing. And she is so deserving. So um, it was great to see her recognized. Um, so the other two listening sessions that I was hoping to add to that. Uh, one at Amherst College, which is already in the works. We just have to identify a date. And then one at UMass. And yes, Dr. Shabazz, I see your hand. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on UMass, um, a listening session there. Well, I don't mean to interrupt. You can No, 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 please. No, no, I'm talking too much. Please talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. So, um, I do know some of the students that are active at uh, UMass and uh, the other thing kind of competing for uh, some of their attention right now is a, um, a tribute 
uh, program, memorial program, um, for the, the late Professor John Bracy, who was kind of a founder of our department, or at least going back to 1972. And um, the that's taking place on Saturday, May 13th. So some of their energies right now are are invested in um, in that event, which is really student driven and and uh, student oriented. So um, the, it, the the department, I, I wish to say, the Du Bois department is uh, looking at a formal memorial event in the fall or or next academic year. Uh, we we felt like we needed more time to do things right than to just do things immediately. So we are supporting um, this this student-led effort, this student-driven effort, but uh, the, the department will have a separate activity, uh, an additional activity na- later uh, next act, uh, in the next academic year. So at any rate, um, I don't know fully yet how much, you know, what their bandwidth is going to be beyond the event on the 13th. Um, there had been some talk uh, about uh, uh, something on May 19th, but we'll we'll see more on that. I had a little bit um, different uh, item than than the listening sessions piece, though. So I'll I'll wait if there's more that for you to uh, finish out on that. No, not really, Dr. Shabazz. I think I, I just wanted to see if um, there were thoughts on those three um, between now and, and you know, the next month and a half, uh, in particular with Amherst College and UMass being that they're going to head toward graduation real soon. So, um, or till the, to the end of the year. Um, so I, I would like to try to get those in place, but that was, that was about it for the listening session. So please go, go ahead. Well, what was the third besides UMass and Amherst College? Um, that was the, the Amherst Survival Center. Okay, Survival Center. All right. So very good. So what I my what I wanted to mention here and following up in future meetings for sure, but um, I internally would really recommend that um, we might all begin to look at um, other reports that have appeared. Uh, even if just a cursor glance at the California task force report, uh, looking at Providence, looking at uh, other uh, municipalities that have um, that have come out with with uh, with reports, um, and uh, you know certainly I, I'm prepared to kind of send a query to um, uh, Robin Rue with First Repair for recommendations on her part uh, for, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that are, are coming up in, uh, in, in, in various municipal plans and municipal uh, reports. Um, uh, also, Asheville, North Carolina comes to mind, uh, which also was a countywide report. Um, so there's, uh, so that's one, at least that's one thing I've been looking at just sort of getting a sense of the, the form and function of some of these reports. Uh, and then secondly, I am putting together a few of my thoughts on sort of guiding, some, some guiding ideas about the nature of our report. And some of them are things that I've been mentioning here in this group for the last, I don't know, two years or, 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 or more. Um, and that is, <coughs> I'll mention a couple of those guys guiding points. But one, I think that our uh, plan and our what we're coming forward with should really emphasize, link itself to, and, uh, and anticipate the development of, a, of, of, of reparations at the federal level. Okay? Um, and I, I see in some of the past reports different sort of orientations around this. So, you know, for example, California calculated what the what is owed uh, to to each eligible individual and put that number out regardless of their own ability to even pay that number. But, you know, that was their that was their approach. It was to try to assess the harm by 
individual eligible California person. Uh, and, and, and that is certainly one way of doing it. I think in our case, though, uh, rather than that kind of theoretical, uh, if you will, or rhetorical or um, that sort of approach that then just comes out with a number like 5 million for each eligible person, you know, or, or 1 million for each eligible Amherst resident. But then that having no connection to the town of Amherst actually being able to do it is not then, in my view, the, the way to approach a, a program that a recommendation that is anticipatory of federal reparations where such a number could be could be uh, uh, grappled with but uh, but rather to aim toward recommendations toward things we think our council can immediately act upon in its own power but and also the anticipatory part is also things that the council might lend its recommendation and endorsement to, uh, but, but, are, but that are things that would be carried on at the federal or at the, the state level. So for example, Congressman McGovern, hearing from us, listening to us, coming to our listening sessions, he was emboldened to write a letter to President Joe Biden calling upon him to take executive action on creating a federal commission to study uh, and make and recommend proposals for recommendations for, for reparations at the federal level. Now, I think while that was a, a nice outgrowth of our relationship with them and of our listening session involvement with them, how much more a powerful would it be for the elected government of the town of Amherst to formally endorse and formally call upon our congressional leaders, not only McGovern, but also Warren and Markey to make similar efforts for, uh, for the support of the commission to study and recommend uh, uh, proposals. Uh, at, 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 as an executive action of President Biden. So to me, that's a concrete recommendation we can make to our council that I think should be right up in the preamble or right up in the early section of our report that the council then can take as an action item amongst the others that let out, but hopefully take it as one action item that it could immediately uh, a vote, and I hope unanimously would vote to to then uh, uh, follow on with recommendation based upon our our work and our recommendation to follow on with with formal letters to Senator uh, Warren, Senator Markey, and uh, uh, and and to uh, uh, Congressman uh, McGovern, uh, particularly thanking him for what he's already done, but but then further, you know, encouraging continued effort efforts to, to make this happen uh, at the executive level. So things like that are where I'm starting to put my, uh, uh, my thoughts down uh, that I will look to share. And, uh, and, and I certainly welcome the, uh, the support, the editorial support and uh, research and writing support of, of Matea, Matea Kramer uh, and, uh, and, and whatever other that can even be uh, be brought in because I, I envision a document with multiple sections, some that we can then begin to, uh, you know, again, enlist expertise and enlist support. If you recall our charge, um, part of our report ought to be speaking about how the kinds of equity initiatives or reparative justice initiatives, how, whatever we resolve on our final language, but how some of these initiatives connect to existing uh, institutions in our town, uh, such as in the business area, the bid and the chamber, such as in things like uh, Amherst Survival Center, land trust, housing, affordable housing efforts, 
that are going on. We're supposed to be registering our thoughts in all of these areas. And I noted today, uh, a counselor, Anna Devon Gauthier, was on WHMP and was speaking about uh, one particular uh, item she passionate about affordable home ownership and you know but the idea there is that when these opportunities are created in Amherst to just dole them out by a lottery system well how much more powerful it might be to have the council think about part of those opportunities or resources being a part of a reparative justice action rather than just by you know pulling a ping pong ball so I'll stop with that, uh, but just to, uh, on the topic of final report, these are some of the things that, that I'm thinking about and beginning to do. Excellent, thank you very much, Dr. Shabazz. And I know that um, that Mattia will be um, following up to listen to our conversations um, and, and and so, and will be with us next week um, for our meeting. So we'll be able to share more. Um, does anyone else, would anyone else like to share any thoughts about the final report or any anything really? Uh, we've basically covered uh, everything on our agenda for today. Um, there are a couple other items that I added to the agenda just to, um, we, we had, um, two weeks ago when we met, spoke about the elementary school building project. Um, I didn't get the sense from the committee then that there was anything this committee felt it should or wanted to do. Um, if that has changed, please do let me know the, uh, vote. There's already actually, uh, voting happening by mail. Early voting is happening later this week. And um, welcome, Alexis. <laughs> can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, so that is on the agenda. If folks would like to revisit that, we can do that now. And then we also have on here the Darity Mullen League of Women Voters uh, racial justice uh collaboration. Um, and I don't have much of an update on that because the group that we're working with to plan that um, hasn't been able to get together. So hopefully we'll be able to get together soon. Um, and I don't know if there are other updates like a BAM update or an HR 40 update that anyone would like to, to provide at this time. Um, but if not, we can call our second period of public comment. Yes, Hala. Um, I don't have a BAM update per se, except to say we will, we will be having our next meeting this Saturday, 1.30 to 3, I believe. And um, yes, I, the, the information has been sent out, but if anybody is listening and didn't get it, could please contact us and we will make sure you get it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hala. And if you need anything from me in terms of if you uh, will be able to talk about the survey during that meeting, if you need anything from me, let me know. All right, so I am going to open up our second period of public comment. Um, again, uh, please use the raise hand function and I uh, will bring you into the room and you will have up to three minutes to express your views. Um, and you can express views about what we've spoken about today or anything that's within our uh, purview here. And um, we will not be able to engage generally, although sometimes we'll, we'll be able to, um, but we will be listening very closely. So I'm looking for hands. And I'll just keep it open for another minute or so here.
All right. So I'm not seeing any hands. So I'm going to close our second public comment period um, and just check in with assembly members now to see if there are any final comments or announcements or discussion um, before this was like our most efficient <laughs> meeting yet. <laughs> um, but there's still some time if folks uh, would like to. Okay, so again, we'll be meeting next week, um, same time, May 1st, 2 o'clock, and Mattia will be joining us for that meeting. Uh, I'd really like to spend a good portion of time with Mattia to talk about our final report. We'll, of course, have another survey update. Um, Alexis, you weren't here. Just so you know, we have, as of this morning, 363 responses to the survey. Um, 43 of the respondents identified as Black. Uh, we spoke earlier about finding ways. Um, we're going to do a direct mailing using the Black census and a resident list um, so that we can target. I'm going to be sending out the resident list. So if um, you, along with others, are going to, if you could go through and just highlight any folks you know, uh, that would be great. And um and, and we have some other ways we talked about getting it out too as well. All right, any other comments, questions before I adjourn? And Pamela, you got to stay for the whole meeting. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you everyone. I'm gonna adjourn at 2.51 PM and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>